कबीरसि बोलिए गजानंद स्वामी की जय उमापति महादेव की जय पवन सुत हनुमान की जय सूर्यनारायण स्वामी की जय नव दुर्गा देवी माता की जय आप लोग आओ जाइए इस तरफ Once again, my friends, as we join on this the first night of this the thirty-third yagya here at the National Council of India Culture, we stand together as one family, bound to each other with love and with respect. Hence, we are here since the establishment of this organization. And once again, we place God first as we commence. The year here, 2019, based on the team, Granta. Om 
we go at the lotus feet of our beloved Guru. As we take the dust of his feet to shine the mirror of our hearts, through the blessing of the Pankanesha Master Swati, the Guru imparts knowledge. And tonight we touch the feet of our Gurus. For without their blessing, knowledge is not possible. Hey Guru Dev, Aapko hum koti koti pranam karte hai. We bow to you millions of times. And we pray that may you bless us on the part of knowledge. That ignorance can never affect us. Salutations again and again to all the Gurus of the universe.
But I know for the past 13 years, since we were here, the teams that we dealt with in our own humble and simple way and where Timalji, he said that we imparted knowledge. I want to show you here. Whatever happened for the past 12 years, and this year being the 13th year, is not our knowledge, but it came, this knowledge comes from our beloved gurus. And that's why last year we had, you all remember the team last year? What was the team last year? Huh? Just last year? <laughs> remember the team last year was? Hindu? Symbolism. No? no. <coughs> Hindu reformers or Sant was the theme of last year's Nagar where we highlighted my friends all the various and great masters who have contributed to the development of Hinduism and Sanatan Dharma. Hindu reformers might be not the right word to translate the word Sant but this is the closest thing in English to translate Sant which means a holy person, a divine person who have lived his or his life or her life to give this knowledge, my friends, to humankind and of course to keep dharma, the life of Sanatan dharma burning. Our first theme in 2007 was Ashtanga Yoga where we dealt with the eight limbs of Sanatan dharma and went into detail as to how we can develop ourselves on the path of spirituality through Ashtanga Yoga. In 2008, we did a very beautiful text composed by uh, Bhagwan Ramana Maharshi, one of another great saint in Hinduism, and we did the text called Upadesar. In 2009, another text by another great saint who was considered to be the light of his time, and that was none other than Bhagwan Shankaracharya Ji, who gave us the text called Bhajagovindam. Then we went on in 2010 to the Bhagavad Mahapuran highlighting the glories of Bhagavan Sri Krishna. He is Purna Avatar and he, my friends, incarnated on this world, in this world, to live among us as an ordinary human being and he was the embodiment of bhakti and the embodiment of love and hence the Bhagavad is a bhakti granta we saw in 2010. In 2011, we went on to Bhagavan Sri Ram. Bhagwan Sri Ram Chandraji, who is the embodiment, the uh, Purushottam Ram, Maryada Purushottam Ram, the perfect human being. And we classified him as a human being because he did Manushya Avatar. He incarnated his soul as an ordinary human being for that purpose to show us Dharma in every aspect of our lives. In 2012, we went to the greatest devotee of uh, Sri Ram Chandraji, who was Sri Ram Bhakta Hanuman. And we saw, my friends, the, the leela, the activities, the lifestyle of Hanuman Swami and we are down into the philosophy of his teachings and what he represents not in Sanatan Dharma but what he represents in our lives. Most importantly, in 2013, we again went back to Bhagwan Krishna looking at him as Purna Avatar. We looked at him as his complete, him being the one in his complete manifestation and one thing I can recollect from that year here we said that, you know, Sri Ram by himself is not complete. He's not Purna Avatar. He is, he comes with 14 colors, 14 different powers, but he is not Purna. 16, he must have 16 colors in order to be Purna Avatar. And Bhagwan Krishna came with that 16 colors and therefore he became Purna Avatar. In order for Sri Ram to be Purna Avatar, he must have Sita Devi. Lakshman and Hanuman with him and then in that Ram Darbar then Sri Ram becomes Purna Avatar. He becomes now not an ordinary human being but he becomes now a divine being expressing divine powers and divine qualities. Sita Devi must be with him. Lakshman and Hanuman in that Ram Darbar he becomes Purna Avatar. Then in 2014 we went on to Bhagwan Shiva. Is it when we saw the Shiva Manas Puja? You all remember? Shiva Manas Puja. We did a complete yagya on just worshipping Bhagwan Shiva in our mind. Om Shri Ganeshaya Namaha Ragnayehi Kalpitamasanam Himachalehi Snanam Chadivyambaram Nanarat 
रत्न विभूषित मृगमदांगित चंदन जाती चंपक देव पत्र रचित पुष्प चतुपम प्रथा दीपम देवदयानिधि पशुपति the mother of this universe in her various manifestation one of the most beautiful years to me personally apart from all the other years was 2016 my friends when we glorify and praise the divine mother ganga it was to me a very touching and a very beautiful experience my personal experience though ganga devi my friends i felt as though she still flows in the form of knowledge, wherever we are, Ganga Devi in 2016. In 2017, we looked at the team Hindu symbolism and we saw all the various aspects of the symbols in Hinduism and what it means and how important it is, my friends. Again, connecting the symbols to our spiritual development. And now in 20, sorry, 2018, we looked at the Hindu reformers. We saw where all the great saints and sages and great masters, not only of ancient time, but even of the uh, recent past and even in the modern times, who have touched our lives in some way or the other. To keep Sanatan Dharma alive and to keep Sanatan Dharma, what we call the light of Sanatan Dharma shining. This year, 2019, the theme is, however, different once again where the NCIC is now exposing us to grant and as Timon said it could have been grant but whenever you do something with love and whenever you do something with faith the grant will come I promise you Today, my friends, as we look, as we begin the team, Granta, 
what does it mean? What is the meaning of this word grant? What does it have in it for us? And when it comes to Yagya and discourses and sitting in an environment like this, we must become very selfish. Because my friends, we came here for something. Every one of us came here for something. It's not Prasad. It's not Mahanbo. It's not the food. We didn't come to see the beautiful deco of the Nagar this year. We came for the Maha Prasad, which is knowledge. And in our own humble and simple way, what you might be listening to is something you already know. We have very intelligent people. We have very intelligent audiences. We have very educated human beings. And every one of us, my friends, are in our own way, educated and we have our knowledge. So you might be reminded of something that you already know. But the million dollar question is, how are we going to take this knowledge and apply it in our personal life for our spiritual development to gain what we are searching for from the objective world to the subjective world. We are looking for something. We are searching for something. And my friends, that search can only culminate when we find it. And the question is, what that is. Grant gives us that. In all, in every grant, that what we are searching for is present. But it is not ours. What we are searching for is in every grant on this altar here, where you have the Bhagavad Mahapura, you have the Devi Bhagavatam, you have the Upanishads, eight of them, you have the Sri Ram Charitamanas, in every one of those sacred texts, what we are searching for is, is it is present, but it has not become ours. And the question is, why? And the question is, how? How will it become ours? What are we searching for? My friend, we shall see tonight in our introduction, and we shall see for the rest of the week, what can we do? To lift what is in the ground and put it into our lives. With this, my friends, we go into introduction, rather invocation, sorry. Today being the final day of the Lauratri period, where Devi Ma has been worshipped for, well, actually eight days. You have nine titis. But the titi, the first titi started the day before uh, uh, when the Pitrapaksh was going on. It started on the midday of that particular day. So the actual first day of the Navratri was actually from midday, the second titi. So today being the, uh, what you call, not really the ninth day, but the ninth titi, Navratri ends today, as a matter of fact, tonight. So today being this day, the ninth day of the Navratri period, we have fasted, we have done devotion, we have glorified and praised the Divine Mother in our own humble way. And tonight, through the medium of this wonderful stotra, we will sing only a few verses of it. And then we will go into our discourse, our introduction to the team Granta. As we invite you now to close your eyes. Think of the Divine Mother. She is Durga Devi. She is Mahalakshmi. She is Saraswati. She is our mother. She is the wife in the home. She is the daughter or the daughters of our home. She is the female of society. This is the perspective of Hinduism. When we worship the Divine Mother, we lift the worship from the altar, from the ritual, into our practical lives. And we honor the Mother 
यत्र नारियंते पूजंते रमंते तत्र देवता सस्त महाभारत We worship the mother. We revere the wife. We worship the Kanya Kumari, the children, the young girls. We worship them and we respect them. Ma, you come in all these forms. Ma, you are called by all these names. And tonight, we thank you for allowing us to worship you, Devi Durga. We thank you for giving us the strength, the courage, the inspiration. And most importantly, the protection. Mom, may you protect us in body. May you protect, protect us in mind, and protect us from our emotions. May you, Durga Devi, protect our intellect, and may you protect us, Mom, at home, at work. Protect our children at school. Protect us while traveling, oh Devi Mom, by air, by water. Or even on the roadways of our nation, when we rise in the morning, Ma, we bow to you in the form of Dharti Mata, seeking that permission to place our feet upon you in the form of Gauri Devi. For this, we ask you to please forgive us, O Devi Ma. In the form of Gauri, we are indeed very sorry to place our feet upon you, Ma. But you are the foundation of our lives. You are the one that upholds us. In every aspect, O Devi Ma, tonight we pray that may you protect us every step of the way. May you protect those tonight who are having problems and are worried. They are crying for some reason. They are hurt on the inside because of some emotional pain or conflict. There are some who are lying in hospital beds or maybe in their homes, but they are not well. Ma, you are the greatest healer and doctor. As you extend your healing touch, we pray for such individuals, Ma. Tonight we thank you in the same breath for the help that we have. We thank you for life. We thank you for one of the precious gifts that you have given, the gift of a beautiful family, Ma. When we look around, there are many who knows not who to turn to, and who knows not where the next meal is coming from. We thank you for the Maha Prasadam, the food that you gave to us, and the food that you give to us. For you are Annapurna Devi, and therefore, Devi Ma, may your blessing be upon Diwali Nagar 2019. May your blessing be upon this year. May your blessing be, Ma, on the main stage of the National Council of Indian Culture. May your blessing and protection be upon all those who will be performing and all those who will be contributing to Dharma, O Ma Devi. We bow to you tonight. And as we glorify you, may you continue to destroy any form of negativity internally or even externally. Oh.
question from the altar of Hinduism there are so many texts and so many different books each of the different devis and devtas has a text or a grant that highlights their glories and highlights their leela and there are many questions that might come to a person's mind when we think about Hinduism and the amount of texts that we have. And some of the questions one may ask, they are as follows. How many texts are there? Question number one. How many? Can you find an answer to that question? How many texts are there? In how many different languages? Next question, important question to ask. Are all these texts important? 
like a young child, or the youths of the modern society now, they are growing up and they know if somebody belongs to another religion, they may say, you know, I have one to follow or two to follow and that's it. But are all these texts in Hinduism important? And do they, my friends, go hand in hand? Are they interrelated or connected in some way or the other? Are they sharing the same thought? In Hinduism, what is the primary text? If there is a primary text, or a secondary text, and if there is a primary or a secondary, which one should we read? Why is each scripture so profound and significant at the same time? Why each scripture is so profound and significant? Why in Hinduism or Sanatan Dharma, the only religion or the way of life that is considered to be the eternal way of life, why are there so many different thoughts? Are these different thoughts leading to the same goal or the same destination? Looking at all those different texts that our forefathers introduced to us in this part of the world, are they all going to lead us to the same place? And are we going to find what we are searching for? Any one of them? In Christianity, they have how many? Bible, New Testament, Old Testament. So if you want to connect with a, a religion, you connect, they, they will go to the Bible and you connect with one text and you can get your information or insight there. In the, in the Islam religion, you go to the Quran and you get your insight there. So Muslims just have the Quran. Another question. When you're doing a yagya, what kind of yagya you will do? <coughs> Ramayana yagya? Bhagavat yagya? Shiv Quran yagya? Devi Bhagavatam? Which one? You know, long ago, in the days of uh, the former uh, Dharmacharya, who was the father of our beloved Dilkinan and Sharmaji, in his time, and in my Aja time, and my Dada time, and father's time, they used to have Bhagavat all the time. So long ago, everywhere you go, it is Bhagavat, three times a day. And then suddenly, that Bhagavat changed, and now every Yagya is Ramayana. Even, if it do, even though, if it is not Ramayana Yagya, we hear people say, I'm going Ramayana. So, it is like stereotyping every yagya to be Ramayana yagya. Now, nothing is wrong. But what kind of yagya should we do? What text should we choose? Another question. Are the Hindu rituals based on scriptures? Like Pandiji performed puja, you did your fasting and devotion. Are all these things and rituals and fasting etc. based on scriptures? and should be prescribed. Are these prescribed verses, my friends? What is practice for convenience in this modern busy world? Or should we just do what we have to do, busy, busy, and just go about our way? You don't offer gel when you're busy, you throw it. <laughs> Get up and don't take the time when you offer your flowers. Just go on, go on. How should it be done? Can the answers to these questions be found in this in the grant? And the answer is, my friends, every question we have based on Sanatan Dharma can be found in our grantha. In every text, somewhere it is mentioned. It is not just a tradition that our forefathers have given to us, they got it from somewhere, the tradition that we follow, they got it from somewhere, and they are passing it on to us. They have passed it on to us, and for us now to pass it on to the youths of the day, to our children and the youths of the day, because tradition are also developed 
in the bosom of the Granta that we follow. Brothers and sisters and devotees of God, the principal sacred text of Sikhism contains hymns and poetry as well as the teaching of the first five gurus of Sikhism called the Sri Guru Nanak, Sri Guru Angar, Sri Guru Amar Das, Sri Guru Ram Das, and Sri Guru Arjan. These great masters, my friends, they worship the Granta, they compose hymns and verses, they created the Granta that they worship from the altar of Sikhism. In Sanskrit, Granta literally means not just a book. That's when we think of the word Granta, we think of a book. But when you attend a Hindu wedding and you hear the word Granti Bandha, what does that mean? In a Hindu wedding, how many of you are married? How many of you are married? When you went to your wedding and the other part of the wedding call, the Granti Bandha. What is the meaning of the word Granti? Remember, right after the Kanyadan, when the Dullahim comes over to the Dullaha, she sits on the right hand side of the Dullaha, facing now the eastern direction, then the father comes and he ties this Granti Bandha. The bond of love. Granti means a knot. So now this knot of love is tied between the bride and the groom. And also, my friends, Granti or Granta also translates to mean a knot. So what does the knot do? The knot joins the bride and the groom through certain mantras and through the blessing of the devtas, the mantras being chanted, we believe that the couple, they are tied together in the bond of love. They are tied together in the bond of holy matrimony. So the joining of the bride and groom, Garanti Bandha, the Sanskrit Granta, it also means a knot. It is a word, my friends, that was used also for books and the script used to write them. This stems from the practice of binding inscribed palm leaves using a length of thread held by knots. Long ago, books never used to be the way they are today, properly binded, probably in some uh, print tree, etc. But long ago, they used to use the write on the leaves, as you all recollect or remember. When we study the uh, history of Sanatana Dharma, they will write on the leaves. And if you look on two sides of the altar here, you have two uh, Bhagavatam, the Bhagavad Mahapuran and the daily Bhagavatam, also the open leaves. So each one is placed on the other and there are stuck of them. So long ago, and even before that, it used to be actually leaves actual leaves and the knot used to be used for the purpose of joining them together the palm leaves using a length of thread held by knots my friends it would also be noteworthy to explore this term knot what is this knot brothers and sisters is it Or is it this that this not means knowledge when it comes to the grant? What does this not do? Is it the truth or knowledge of the divine? First, learn through the voices of the great masters. First, learn through letters recorded, recorded as more persons learned to read my friends the knot that binds us to people is it to society is it a knot that binds us to the world 
to this universe or is it not that grinds us to Brahman? Brothers and sisters and devotees of God, the purpose of this knot is to connect us. Like each palm leaf is connected to each other through that knot, binding whatever was written by the great saints and sages. It is bounded together. My friends, is this not to connect us as a society, to bind us to this world or to this universe or to Brahman? To connect us, my friends, to each other. What is this not? Granta slash knots are symbolical. And we have to understand the symbolism of this very sacred knot. Symbolic representations and a vehicle for ancient wisdom. This particular meaning of the term Granta, my friends, is that which leads us to the ancient wisdom of our great Dharma. What are the methods? which man can attain this ancient wisdom? What are the methods by which man can attain this, in the commas, knowledge that will bind us to whatever we want to be bounded to in Hinduism? This method, my friends, is called as Pramans. Our beloved Bhayati Malji mentioned the word Praman earlier. Praman means the method by which we gain knowledge. Praman means the method by which we gain knowledge. And in Hinduism, there are six different Pramans. There are six different ways. There are many more, but six main ones. And they are as follows. First one is called as Pratyaksha Praman. The means of knowledge called as Pratyaksha. Acquiring knowledge from experience. Now, true Pratyaksha Praman, like you know, they say, you know, when you have experience of a certain uh, job type, you can use that experience. You may not have what you call a certificate, or you may not have what you call any degree that qualifies you to do what you are doing. But you have experience in that particular job because you were trained directly under somebody. Like you don't know go. The mechanic garage and stuff, you go, if you can't go to school, it's like you to learn a trade. So you go to the garage and you learn a trade, electrical, auto electrical, or mechanic or something, and then you are qualified, you know everything about the car. But do you have a certificate? No. But you have the experience. Pratyaksha Praman means where we gain knowledge from experience. Pratyaksha Praman. Second Praman is called as Anuman Praman. Anuman Praman means where we acquire knowledge by inferring with true inference. Example, I'm going to say something, I want you all to finish it. Where there is smoke, who told you that? <laughs> where there is smoke, there is, it is understood that there might be fire. Nobody said it is fire. But you, my friends, you inferred that where there is smoke, there might be fire. That is called as Anuman Praman. Then you have Upaman Praman. Upaman Praman means you gain knowledge through comparison. Learning by observing similarities. <coughs> Upaman Praman. Then you have the fourth one, Artapati. Postulation. And this, my friends, is also another method by which we gain knowledge and understanding of some subject matter. Artapati. Then you have Anupalabdhi. Non apprehension. Understanding non existence by non perception. This is called as Anupalabdhi. And then the sixth one is called as Shabda Praman. 
Shabd Praman means verbal testimony, gaining authentic knowledge from spoken and written words. Gaining knowledge, authentic knowledge that is, from spoken or written words is called as Shabd Praman. Shabd itself translates to mean words. Now friends, these are the various methods by which we gain knowledge according to Sanatan Dharma, according to Hinduism. So these, what you call Pramanas, Shabda Praman, etc. will help us to gain a better understanding of some subject matter or some theme or some topic, etc. that we are discussing by different ways. Now, what is our purpose and our individual and collective responsibility it is not the grant that we talk about, the not that we spoke about, or this knowledge that we are seeking through the various pramanas, Shabda Praman, Anuman Praman, etc. Is it to manifest the not in your daily life, to change, to evolve, to protect, to honor, to be at peace, to become a not, or to become a grant? My friends, What's the purpose of knowledge? What is the purpose of knowledge gained? What is the purpose of experience gained? What is the purpose of the knowledge that we are seeking? It must do something. Something must happen with this knowledge. And then not just to have a qualification or a degree or to have some understanding, it must do something for us. You see, you can say, you know, well, if I have knowledge of some subject matter that is academic, I can get some good job, I can have a high paying job, I can get a good salary, from that good salary I can have anything I want. And that is not true. To have a good paying job, you can have anything you want. That is not true. Because what we really want, money can buy. Isn't it? What you really want in life? Everybody will say, well, I want nice things, nice car, nice house, nice whatever, nice clothes, luxury, comfort. But those are things that will help us to be comfortable. There is something higher, there is a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. My friends, this is where this knowledge that we are seeking from the Granta, from the not that we want to tie ourselves to, from the scriptures that we are going to study, to protect ourselves, to honor, to be at peace, to become one with. See, a book, my friends, not any book is a granter. You see, not any book is a granter. Not everybody is, well, let me put it this way. You have so many books. You have books that teach you different languages. You have science, chemistry, maths, English, whatever. There's so many different kind of books. But not every book is a grant. Not every book can be considered to be a grant. Anybody can be a guru. But not everybody is Shri Guru. Anybody you can learn something from. But the person who imparts to us the knowledge that is found in the grant that has become one with him who decides to impart that knowledge on to those who are with, uh, what you call willing to receive that knowledge for the purpose of self-evolution and for the purpose of peace and shanti within that person alone is called Shri Guru anybody can be Guru anybody can put on clothes like this you can learn something from somebody in the street. You can learn something from a homeless person. That person is a guru. 
the Tatre Guru had 24 Gurus. One was a python, one was a mountain, okay, one of his Gurus was a, was a prostitute. And he was proud to say that the prostitute was my Guru. She taught me something. When you go to the Bhagavad Maha Quran or the Datta Tare Gita, you will see where the 24 Gurus are there and he learned something from them all. My friends, so the point is, anyone can read any book. But which book is called a Granta? My friends, what qualifies a book to be called a Granta? What does a grant seek to give to us, to disseminate? And if a grant seeks to impart knowledge, wisdom, then one could say that a grant is a book of knowledge written on paper and with ink. However, as we will see, the magic is not found, my friends, in the paper or the ink. But the question is, where was the knowledge that seeks to be uh, disseminated before it went on paper and ink? And this is a question I want you all to think about. You see, friends, we have so many different granta. But where is the knowledge? Where was the knowledge before it went on paper and ink? Think about that very subtly. This knowledge that is within the grant was somewhere existing prior to the paper and the ink. And this, my friends, is very, very important. And the answer to that question or the reply to that question can be that this knowledge was somewhere in the Akash. This knowledge was somewhere in the universe or maybe somewhere existing in some form that is unmanifest. And every time a new man, uh, what do you call a manwanta? Every time a new kalpa, every time a new yuga starts, this knowledge comes down in some way or the other by the great masters, the great seers, the great Maharaj Manu. My friends, in every manwanta, in every age, there is a Manu that appears. And what he does? He codifies all ethical and social regulations to be followed during that particular manwanta. So the rules and the codes of conduct for Satyu and the Treta Yug and the Dwapa Yug and the Kali Yug all changes. Raja Manu gives, my friends, the codes of all ethical conducts, etc. And tonight, we must also ask the question, why is a book called a grant? This has a direct bearing on the process medium through which the knowledge, my friends, in the Akash or the universe arrives on paper and ink. And this is where I want our Hindu brothers and sisters to understand and to remember that here is this knowledge in the universe, on manifest, it is not on paper and ink. And this knowledge is eternal, it is everlasting, it is sanatan, it is forever. This knowledge is existing in the universe. And friends, when the saint and sages, I want the young people to be very attentive. When the saint and the sages and the great yogis of ancient times, they were able through the process of meditation to sit on the seat of meditation in a very silent and unique fashion. Their mind, my friends, was no longer connected to the physical sheet called the body, but their mind was then connected to the universe. The mind was connected to the Akash. The mind was connected to the world above, beyond what the physical world is showing. And because their mind was able to connect to that, my friends, they were able to get not glimpses, but the knowledge started trickling down, my friends, from the Atash into the reservoir of the mind of these saints and sages. And in the interest of the different ages, this happened in Satyu, it happened maybe in Treta Yuga, it happened in uh, what you call in a different culpa. 
in a different one one third, maybe 20, 25, 30,000 years ago, maybe 100,000 years ago, we don't kind of put the time to this, uh, what you call, the revelation. But the saints and sages, my friends, they were able to tap into this, what you call, Akash, this universe, and the knowledge started trickling down. And when I say trickling down, I mean it started revealing itself into the mind of the saints and sages. They didn't just take it. They reflected upon it. They filtered the knowledge that was flowing. They filtered it into their minds, into their intellect, and they recorded what they understood from what was revealed to them. They recorded what was understood by what was revealed to them. So some would have understood some parts, some would have understood another to topic, some would have understood, like for example in the Dhamma, you have four different topics going on. And when you go to uh, Prayag, that's just off Varanasi, a couple miles, a couple hours, right? Prayag there, yeah, the three sisters, Ganga, Yamuna, and Saraswati, the three holy rivers met at that point. And it is said, my friends, there, yeah, four kathas are going on simultaneously by Tulsidas, she is speaking to the saints and sages. Yagyabhaut is speaking to Bharadwaj. Lord Shiva is speaking to Mara Parvati. And Kaakushundaji is speaking to Garur. Simultaneously, 24 7, 365. Since. However long. And the four topics being discussed Jnana and Vairagya. Gyan, knowledge, Gyan, Bhakti and Vairagya. These knowledge are being discussed. Tulsidas is speaking about Bhakti, Lord Shiva and Parati Devi discussing uh, Gyan. So when you read the Ramayana and you see Lord Shiva is speaking, he is speaking on the topic Gyan. When you see Tulsidas is speaking, you'll see Tulsidas he is speaking about Bhakti or devotion. When you see uh, Yagyapal speaking to Bharadwaj, the topic changes. Kaakushundi is speaking to Garur, the topic changes. So that is how we know that when you are going through the sacred text, my friends, the topics are changing accordingly, but they are all speaking about something that should be beneficial and will be beneficial to the Shrotas, the ones who are listening. They are all speaking on topics that are beneficial for the development of the devotees who will be following. And friends, my point is, that these great Mahatmas and Rishis, they received this knowledge, it was revealed, it was like a revelation to them. Revelation of this knowledge flowed. And that's why, my dear brothers and sisters, the saints and sages, as time went by, it made sense to them, as it was revealed to them. But they, want, but they wanted the, end, the what you call the future of the world to experience what they have experienced. They wanted the future of the world to experience what they have experienced. And friends, for they, for those saints and sages, it was like immediate experience of that revelation of divinity and what you call spiritual evolution. It was like the snap of a finger. For you and I, it is different. We are not living in Satyu. We are not living in Treta Yuga or Dwapa Yuga. We are living in Kali Yuga, my friends. So the experience or the experiences of the saints and sages of that time will be completely different to what you and I would experience in this time, in this age, in this Kalpa. But if we do experience it, the experience remains the same. The result of the experience remains the same because the goal is one, the result is one, that never changes. My friends, the sages in this deep state of yogic trance, lifting their frequency to match the frequency levels of the Akash or what you call the universe, whereby the wisdom contained therein are revealed to them during those deep states of meditation. Having regard to this body of revealed information, the sages distilled, my friends, the revealed knowledge, wisdom, in two categories, and two very broad categories. They are called as Shruti, and the second one is called as Smriti. 
that which was heard. Shruti means that which was heard. They were in their meditation and they heard the voice of the Akashvani revealing this knowledge. And they named this category of knowledge as Shruti. When you study the Upanishad, whether you're studying the Ishabasi Upanishad, the Kato Upanishad, you will see where Shruti Mata is speaking. Shruti Mata means they revealed information, that which was heard. And then you will hear. Smriti. Smriti means that which was remembered. That also was recorded. And that also is recorded. So Shruti, my friends, means reveal the scriptures. So the Vedas and the Upanishad falls in the category. I was telling uh, our beloved president, like in this book here, this has many of our great Upanishads, and I will just mention a few. Isha Vasi Upanishad, Narayan Upanishad, Aitari Upanishad, Taitri Upanishad, Maha Narayan Upanishad, Brihadan, Dhanin, Yaka Upanishad, Ganapati Atarva Upanishad, Surya Upanishad, Kato Upanishad, Munduko Upanishad, Manduki Upanishad, Prashna Upanishad, Keno Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, Shvetashvara Upanishad. All these Upanishads are here. Isha Vasi Upanishad, etc. So, so many different Upanishads are there, or Upanishads are there, and my friends, all these forms different parts of the Vedas. Reveal knowledge. So the Vedas, you have the Rig Ved, the Sam Ved, the Yajur Ved, and the Atharva Veda. The Rig Ved, my friends, has the songs praising the Devis and the Devdas. The Sam Ved has the hymns with instructions for chanting. The Yajur Ved has the hymns with instructions for Yajna and instructions for Puja and the instructions for sacrifices. The Atharva Ved has a collection of knowledge on moral and ethical conduct. Then, these are were divided further into Samhitas and Brahmanas, Aranyakas and Upanishad. So the Vedas were also divided in the form of Upanishad. And that is what you call as the revealed knowledge, Shruti Mata, giving that revealed knowledge in the form of the Upanishad. And this is why, my dear brothers and sisters, why we are here? We are here to study Granta. But not just the term Granta, but what was written in these Granta and what was revealed to these great masters and to see if we can have a glimpse or to feel if we can have a, an experience of what they would have experienced thousands of years before us. Thousands of years before us. My friends, this Shruti Mata and Smriti the remembrance of this knowledge is indeed very, very important for us. And so, Hindus believe that the Shrutis were revealed by God Himself. And the eternal Shrutis were remembrance by the great saints and sages that they passed through, passed down rather through generations according to the needs of time. And this is also very important. According to the needs of time, there are three things we must always take into consideration. They are called as Desh, Kal, or Vastu. According to place, time, and situation. Friends, be very attentive. According to Desh, Kal, or Vastu, time, place, and situation, Hinduism can be adjusted. I'm going to repeat that. According to time, place, and situation, Hinduism is flexible. That it can be, what you call, adjusted accordingly, my friends. And this is why, you know, in Hinduism, nothing's supposed to be a problem. And we in Hinduism, they make everything a problem. Why did you offer orange flowers? Why did you put the lotus soap? Why did you put the lotus soap? 
When you offer the child, what to put the rota baba? So or so? I mean, when you offer it hard, you're supposed to turn over the lotta, or how you supposed to leave it upwards? How do you put it down? How are you supposed to do that? Turn it over, leave it up. When you offer that, don't you all just offer both of them? When you offer it hard, how do you keep the lotta? Up so? Or the mouth on top, or the turn over? See friends, remember this. It's not how you keep the lota, whether you turn it over or you keep it up. It's how you keep your mind. <coughs> that is important. When you're doing puja, it says sit flat on the ground. Right? Sit down flat on the ground when you're doing puja. Some people say, Baba, can't sit down flat in a lot people. But don't want to sit down higher than God. Say, Baba. You can never be higher than God. Sit down to be comfortable. That is important. Desh Kaal or Vastu. Pandit Devakinana and Sharmaji would remember, you know the older Pandits? They will never, probably some in Trinidad also, they will never do a puja under a house. And they say if you can avoid it, avoid it. Don't do puja under your house. I went to New York and I got down somebody's basement. <laughs> and two other families living up there, none of us know them. And the people who want to do their puja in the living room. And the living room in the basement. Desh, Kal, or Vastu. According to place, time, and situation, you adjust accordingly. And our dharma flex accordingly, my friends. Because what we are doing should not really be done on the outside. Changes are to be made on the inside. And this is where the different scriptures and different rules are codified and interpreted by different interpreted, uh, interpreters for the purpose of our development, for the purpose of our peace of mind. And friends, all these scriptures are there for us to follow, all these various forms of knowledge are given by different interpreters and by different teachers and by different masters for one reason and that is for us to arise and awake out of the darkness that we are in. The internal darkness. You know there is a budget that says Aaj andhere me hai hum insan Gyan ka suraj You all sing? Sing it again. Ajandere Ajandere, today we are in darkness. Friends, how can there be so much light and yet we are in darkness? Something must be wrong. And you know what is wrong? The knot was not time. Dullah had gone one side, Dullah had gone one side. The knot wasn't tied. The knot wasn't tied between the seeker and the guru. You know, in every Upanishad, it be begins with a Shanti mantra. And my friends, the Upanishad begins with Om Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunattu, Sahavidyam Karvavahe, Tejas Vinavadi Tamastu, Mavid Vishabahe. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. The Mandukya Upanishad begins with Om Purnamadaha, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamudachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva, Vashishate. Each Upanishad begins with a Shanti part. It is to make a connection with the divinity. To tie the knot that we are supposed to tie in the beginning of the study of the Upanishad or the Vedas or whatever to get this knowledge, my friends, to tie within ourselves. So it is a bond in the case of the marriage between Adullah and Dullahim. But in the case of the Granta, it is a bond between the seeker and the knowledge or the thought that is about to be established. And once we are able to make that bond or that what you call that union or that marriage or that what you call uh, 
not between the seeker of knowledge and the teacher of knowledge or the scripture of knowledge or the grunt of knowledge once that bond is there my friends you know what will happen the time has come. The time has come, my friends. Now, put the jada musafir to arise and awake with the study of Granta. Put the jada musafir for a bay of a day that a heart was over One of the most powerful statements in the Kato Upanishad, Uttishta Jagrat Pratinivan Nibodata. Now is the time to arise and awake 
from his slumber of ignorance and from his slumber of sleep, my friends. And so, in our introduction tonight, Granta have the power to introduce to us to a universe drastically different from the universe that we believe that we live in. The grant has the power to introduce us to a universe drastically different. Therefore, this knowledge, my friends, or wisdom, when embedded in paper and ink, is used to impact our lives, to uplift us morally, and to help us to evolve spiritually. Then the shape of collection of paper and ink, then rather the shape of the collection of paper and ink that is called as a grant, that which helps us to shape our lives. My friends, all religions have grant. Islam, the Quran, Christianity, the Bible, Sikhism, Adi Granta. The Hindus have the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana. We have Prakaran Granthas. These Prakaran Granthas are also, like for example, Bhagwan Ramana Maharshi, Bhagwan Shankaracharya. This, this knowledge was revealed to them and they made their Prakaran Granthas and they gave it on to us. So, in the Granth of all religion, one would find a common thread, and that is the ethics and code of conduct that shape and influence our thinking and behavior as human beings. Friends, you can have the book in front of you, or you could have God in front of you. It will not make a difference if our attitude and our intention is not to change. I'm going to repeat that. You can have a book in front of you, you can have the ground in front of you, or you can have God in front of you, it will not make a difference if we are not willing to arise and awake and change. This is why when you go to the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, I think there's a beautiful verse there in chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita where Bhagavan Krishna tells Radha Arjuna who was wailing and whining and crying and he was frustrated with life and he didn't want to live anymore. Somebody told me they went to the creek, San Fernando, um, Laramie, to the creek, to a funeral, had five funeral, and two were suicide. People who don't want to live anymore. Very sad. We pray for their soul. But there are many people, friends, who are like Arjuna, frustrated and miserable. But we have to do something. And you know what we have to do? Before the study of any grant, Arjuna did this. He looked at Bhagavan Krishna and he said, My Lord, I want to admit something. I want to admit something to you. And what he says, Arjuna admitted my friends. He looked at Bhagavan Krishna, he says, Karpanya dosho I have a problem. First thing he admitted, I have a problem. When you have a problem, the first thing to do is admit you have a problem. The person who is an alcoholic do admit. He said, I don't drink. I don't like to drink. But you have a problem. As soon as they get up in the morning drinking, no, no, I didn't, I didn't drink. The alcoholic find it difficult to admit. So before you have a problem, in fact, when you have a problem, the first part of the solution to that problem is admitting you have a problem. Arjuna admitted, Karpanya dosho bhavaha. Prabhu, I admit I have a serious problem. And the problem is, I am confused. I am totally confused. I am right now 
in desperate need of your help, O Krishna. He says, my Lord, I am what you call puzzled, I'm confused with regard to what I must do. And therefore, I am asking you, O Krishna, tell me what I should do. Tell me what is good for me. And I want you to tell me right now, O Krishna, what is good for me. Please reveal to me something that will help me because I cannot cope like this anymore. And friends, Arjuna admitted, I am utterly confused. I do not know what my duties are. I do not know in which direction to go. And therefore, I hold on to your feet. I surrender to you. I am your disciple. I am your disciple. You are my guru. Please teach me. You see, that surrender, before any knowledge can come from any grantha into our lives, my friends, First thing we have to do is surrender to a teacher, surrender to a spiritual master, surrender to a guru in order for that knowledge to flow. That's the only way it happens. I remember when I was in India, I went, I didn't know, I was very confused uh, in terms of the language, the Sanskrit, etc. The, the new environment, uh, uh, things like that. And I went to my guru one morning and I said to him, Swamiji, I am reading the Gita, but I am not understanding. <laughs> and what he said to me, I want to say to you tonight what he said to me, and I want you to believe this, friends. He said, you will not understand. No, but never stop reading. Never stop reading. I said to Swamiji, if I, if I read and I don't understand, it will become frustrating. <coughs> I will become confused. He said, never stop reading. And one day, the knowledge will reveal itself to you. Tell me my four stars. The knowledge is such, it will reveal itself for you, to you. Because my friends, devotees of God and Hindus devotees, these, these books seem to be on paper and ink. But they are far beyond what our eyes and our mind can perceive. These, this language is called as Devanagari. Devanagari means translated as Sanskrit, but it's not just Sanskrit. It is the language of the gods. The gods are speaking in these texts, in these grantha. And because the gods are speaking, my friends, their voice will be heard. Don't think thousands of years ago, this knowledge was revealed to the saints and sages and only they could have heard and that they call the Shruti. <coughs> this can also be heard by us. And friends, we have to sit down in our quiet moments, read and connect to that universe, connect to the Akash, connect to the Bhagwan, connect to the Brahman and this knowledge will reveal itself to us. I promise you tonight, on this the first night of this 33rd year of the National Council of Indian Culture on this the 6th day of October 2019. Remember what we told you. Read. Continuously read your scriptures. And even if you don't understand, don't give up. The knowledge will reveal itself to you. This is something that will never die. It is always alive. And therefore, Arjuna, when he said, Shishyasti ham shadimam tuam prapannam, I surrender to you. Please give me this knowledge. Friends, when you are about to study the scriptures, go to your altar. Take any one of them. Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, Upanishad, anything. Go to your altar. Or go to your guru. And what you don't understand, ask him. And my friends, what is important is, Surrender to the knowledge that you are about to study. Surrender to the knowledge. Shishyastiham. Become a disciple. Don't become a teacher when you study. And even a student in school. Because you know something, 
you, you uh, feel you are better than the teacher. Once you are in front of your guru, once you are in front of your teacher, once you are in front of your boy, you surrender. Go down on the ground. And that's what Arjuna did. He fell at the back of the chariot. And Arjuna, my friends, his Gandhiva boat touched the ground for the first time. Never touched the ground before. But he looked at Bhagavan Krishna and he says, Prabhu, Shishyasti ham shadi maam prabannam. I, I want knowledge. That's all I want. Tell me what is good. Sharan me aaye. Ayam tumhari. In our minds, let us surrender to all those granted on the altar. Let us surrender to this knowledge. <laughs> Spiritual teachings and knowledge that it will be revealed to us as well. And when this knowledge is revealed, the purpose for which it is revealed will be understood and will be uh, with us to evolve and to become better in every aspect. So, friends, with this simple introduction tonight, I pray that we 
can grasp something tonight and take it with us as for tomorrow night we will go into some of the different revealed texts some of the different uh, texts that was revealed to the great masters and see what was the purpose of certain verses for our help in this world today and how we can use them to evolve as well Prem Saboliye, Vishnu Bhagavan Ki Jai, Nau Durga Devi Mata Ki Jai. With this tonight I conclude, and at this time we want to invite everyone to please stand as we make the final offering of the Purna Muti into the sacred fire. And we have our final arti and closing prayer.